Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and I, can I uh, welcome members of the press and public to the third meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2015. Uh, we are delighted to be here in Inverness, uh, and can we take this opportunity to thank Highland Council for their hospitality uh, so far. Uh, this is the second time that the committee have visited uh, Inverness. I think our last visit here was in 2005, and so thank you for making us feel so welcome. Uh, can I ask all members of the public uh, present here today to ensure that their electronic items are switched to flight mode uh, or are turned off? Saying also, his colleagues, first of all, we have apologies from Drew Smith and Stuart McMillan in advance of today's meeting. Can I move to agenda item number one, uh, and that is the decision on taking business in private. Uh, the question is that we take agenda item number three in private. Uh, this is to allow the committee to discuss the evidence received and to seek any technical advice from Audit Scotland. Uh, I will agree. Okay. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, agenda item number two is evidence from NHS Highland on the Auditor General's report for Scotland's report entitled uh, the 2013-14 uh, Audit of NHS Highland Financial Agreement. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome our panel this morning. Uh, can I welcome Gary Coutts, the uh, Chair of NHS Highland? Can I welcome Elaine Mead, the Chief Executive of NHS Highland? Uh, Nick Kenton, uh, Director of Finance of NHS Highland? And Chris Brown, Chief Internal Auditor of NHS Highland? Uh, I understand that we have an opening statement uh, from Mr Coutts. Yeah. Uh, a brief Thank you. presentation for... Thank you very much indeed, and can I thank you and the committee uh, for, or can I welcome you to Highland? Um, it's great to see you up here, and I'm particularly pleased that you're going to be able to sp spend time with us this afternoon and come and see some of the great work that we're doing here. Uh, I'm immensely proud of a lot of what we're achieving. Um, I think there are groundbreaking, there's groundbreak working, there's groundbreaking work going on from our partnership with the Highland Council, where we've integrated health and social care, to our absolute commitment to quality improvement, working with acknowledged world leaders to transform our services by putting the individual service user or patient at the heart of all that we do. I hope when you have the chance to hear about some of this work this afternoon, you'll share my excitement about the future. However, I'm aware that this morning we're not looking at the future, but rather looking back at our performance last year. I was as disappointed as anyone that we required an element of brokerage from the Scottish Government to achieve financial balance, and was also very disappointed that the Gen Auditor General saw sufficient weaknesses in our planning and controls to table this Section 22 report. NHS Highland values the audit process. We work closely with both internal and external audit to use, and use their findings to help us to improve what we do locally. And I can assure you that we have reflected long and hard on last year's financial outturn and on the Section 22 report. We'll be able to report to you today positively on the measures we have put in place and the work that is ongoing to try and ensure we have more effective planning and better controls as we go forward, which I hope will give you confidence that we have indeed learned However, I do think it's important that we look at our performance in context. In the 11 years I've been chair of NHS Highland, we've never before required brokerage. In the last five years, almost half of all Scotland's health boards have required some brokerage at one time or another. So that in itself is not an unusual occurrence. In fact, because boards have no capacity to keep reserves, and will always seek to spend all of the resource that's allocated to them, I think it's sensible, and if not inevitable, that NHS Scotland will want to retain some flexibility to support boards who may have slight overspends at the year end. The alternative would be for us to be far more cautious and have far higher underspends with money being returned to the centre, not being used for the benefit of patients and the public locally. The amount of brokerage we required was also relatively small. 2.5 million represents 0.3% of our total budget. I'm not making light of it. It's not desirable and it's not something I ever want us to repeat. But from a three quarter of a billion budget, it is a relatively modest amount. 
Of major concern to the board was the suggestion that it was not aware of the financial position and not involved in decisions about seeking support from government. NHS Highland prides itself in its openness and the level of detail we report in public. We webcast our board meetings, not only as our board held in public, but our committees are as well, which is not standard practice in all public bodies. The extent of our public reporting can, I think, be evidenced by the press cuttings we've seen. I've got a selection of them here which go back to August last year, which are reporting our underspend. So if we were trying to be secretive, we weren't very good at it. On the back of the Section 22 report, we commissioned our internal auditors from Scotland Creef to review aspects of the Section 22 report, including our response to it, and we're joined by Chris Brown, who's our Chief Internal Auditor today. He'll be able to give his independent view of what he's seen, and I hope that also will give you confidence about us going forward. However, I want to be absolutely clear. The Board was fully aware of the financial situation. We made a judgment on the management actions that were being proposed and came to the view that, there were that these were sufficient to bring us back into balance. Our financial position deteriorated because of unforeseen circumstances late in the year, and we were aware that, that there were ongoing discussions with government about the position. This happens routinely and was not the subject to specific reporting, but it was of no surprise to board members. Indeed, it was referenced at public meetings. While the possibility of seeking brokerage was always a possibility, it was not agreed until the 6th of March and even then not signed off until the 12th of March. It was then made public about upon the publication of board reports and press briefings less than a fortnight later and formally reported to, uh, that the next public board meeting six days after that. Again, when this was reported, there was no surprise for board members. We knew the system and the process and the formal board and committee papers had kept us fully up to date. The suggestions that executives kept members in the dark is just not true. Our top team are among some of the most values-driven and transparent professionals I've ever worked with in 30 years in public life. I have 100% confidence in their integrity, and I know they could no more keep us in the dark than fly in the air. Again, I hope the internal audit report will give you confidence in this. Just let me reiterate, we're not complacent about the position we found ourselves in. We do not underestimate the seriousness of it. We've learned the lessons and have been working since the start of the financial year to make improvements in our planning, financial controls and reporting. We have a team of execs, clinicians and managers committed to our quality approach for delivering services. We still have a way to go, but I'm confident that we're on track. We're working in a very difficult environment. Our view is we have to develop a culture of continuous quality improvement led by staff on the ground who are empowered to work with communities, patients, service users, carers and families if we're going to deliver the type of health and care system we all aspire to. It won't be easy, but I genuinely believe we are well placed to deliver and will use the hard lessons of last year to help us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Coots. Can I, can I begin by, uh, first of all, thanking you for your presentation? Uh, and I'll begin with the first question. Uh, can I ask you, you advise us there that you're not uh, complacent. Uh, can you confirm that you accept the report, uh, the Section 22 report, its findings and its conclusions? Absolutely. Um, with the Section 22 report, is, we've discussed it with our, our auditors and they've given a, a fair report of what they saw as auditors do. And we are working hard to make sure that the uh, areas of weakness that they identified that we are learning from. So we are, we are content with that, yes. So can I just ask you to comment on the comments in the Press and Journal uh, today where you were raising concerns and connection with some of the comments from the audit committee and you advised that some of the conclusions were unfounded? Yeah, I think that there's, there's two things here, there are three things actually. There's the audit, the section 22 report, which today I am absolutely saying that we accept uh, what that has reported and we're acting upon it. 
in that report, there is not any suggestions that the board was uh, unaware of the financial uh, position. There was some issues about the timing, uh, and I hope that the internal audit report, which we've now provided as evidence, gives some clarity around that. Um, there were comments made at the last audit committee, um, which we felt did not were not representative of what was said in the Section 22 report and that we did feel was unfair about the, uh, the, the, the way that my board had uh, been informed and discussed the issues. Now, of course, we weren't at that committee, so we... Heard, we didn't get a chance to speak to you and your colleagues about what uh, was being said at that time. And I think if we had, and if we'd been able to provide the evidence that is contained within our timeline and within the uh, internal audit report, I think you'd have got some assurance that far from being kept in the dark, we were absolutely open about the way that we were working there. And if I can make one further point. If it's possible in the responses, please. I will, and succinct this, please. I, I will uh, as much as I can that the we we the auditor uh, had a number uh, had looked at our board meetings. I don't believe that I personally had spent enough time with the auditor to make sure that they were completely aware of all of the scrutiny that took place at all of our committee meetings, which was vital to our governance. And if they had been, I think that uh, they would have been able to give you different advice at the committee. Some colleagues will have questions in that uh, later. Ms. Mead, can I just ask you, can you clarify for the record who the accountable officer is for NHS Highland? Yes, for the record, I am the accountable officer as chief executive of NHS Highland. Okay, so just, you know, for, for the record, I think we all want to be clear about this. Uh, reporting to the board is your responsibility and your responsibility alone it as the accountable me. officer. It is absolutely my responsibility to report to the board. So can you advise me how your heads of department, which you'll have a number of, I have absolutely no doubt, how do they report to you? So I meet with them regularly. We also meet on a weekly basis as a leadership team. And we meet formally as a senior management team, um, and that's an audited meeting. And do they keep you informed of all of the all aspects of the, the board's activities, including financial reporting? They do. I keep very close convener to the detail, particularly around the financial activity. Um, I meet with my chief operating officer, who in turn meets with the directors of operation on a regular basis. And so I'm very close to the financial position. So how, how would you expect them to keep you informed? Would you expect them to keep you informed informally? Or would you expect formal papers to advise you on a regular basis what information that you've you'd wish to receive in respect of the financial arrangements within the board? So we, we have more recently strengthened that reporting through a, a performance board that I'm now chairing. Uh, but up until that time, they were less, inform less formal and more informal discussions, meeting with my colleagues, as I've said already, on a weekly basis. Um, but there'll be papers that go through to our senior management team and then onwards to the board. And my executive colleagues contribute, particularly the director of finance, um, draws up the finance report for the board and the improvement committees. So just for clarity, again, for the record, mm -hmm. if you find yourself in a position or your heads of department find themselves in a position where perhaps there are some financial challenges facing their departments, you would expect to receive that information quickly, wouldn't you, and formally? Absolutely. Yeah. I would expect to know so, it very quickly. So in terms of the position that the board found themselves in, the board were facing significant financial challenges. There was a brokerage uh, being negotiated would you not find yourself in a position as an accountable officer that you should formally provide that information to the board members in the same way that you would expect your managers to provide that information to you? I would, convener, and I did my best to do that by making sure the chairman was aware of our final decision to secure brokerage. Just to be clear here, though, we're actually talking not about the final decision. We're talking about the negotiations that were taking place with the Scottish Government, and this is referred to in the Audit General Report. So if we can be clear, your responsibility as accountable officer is to provide that information it on an is. ongoing basis as you would expect your managers to do. It is, and I was discussing with the board our financial pressures throughout the year. So my board were quite clear both at in formally, they were formally advised. and informally. And they, that's available in the board papers it in respect to the brokerage position. The brokerage position was only formally agreed on the 12th of March. No, I understand it was agreed, yes. but... For clarity, again, and this is in the Audit General Report, yes. 
discussions concerning board members being aware of that a brokerage was being discussed. At what stage was that advice to the board? So that advice to the board was, let me just look at the detail here. So I was about to take you through the timeline, uh, convener. Would that be helpful to take no, you No, I think we've timeline? already got the timeline. Okay. Yeah, if so, it, if it so just be clear, though, in terms of, I mean, I think we just, we just want to be clear here. What you expect of your managers, your heads of department, is what the board members would expect of you. Am I correct in that? It is, and yeah. I've done my best to be able to keep the board informed, yeah. both formally and but do, informally. Do you accept it's informal, though? I, I advising board members at a development session that we're looking at the possibility of brokerage is unacceptable. Do you accept that? I would accept that was in an informal situation. Yeah. I was speaking and do you to the board about the challenges yeah. of our financial position. Yeah. So you, so you have significant responsibility as accountable officer. You paid a salary of £120,000 a year plus pension benefits. And that, those benefits are available to you because of the significant responsibility that's expected of you. Surely your board members would have expected you to provide formal information in connection with the financial management of the organisation as you would expect your managers to do. And I did my best to give that information I appreciate to you did board. your best, but it didn't happen, though, did it? It did happen as soon as we secured brokerage. No, no, I appreciate it was secured, yes. but do you accept that there was negotiations taking place and that information should have been provided, as On you would have expected your management team to do, to you? Yes, I do accept okay. that. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, explore one or two of the points that have been raised in the Auditor General's report. Um, the Convener's already touched on brokerage, and in 2013-14, the brokerage was £2.5 is there a prospect that brokers will be required again this year? I, I certainly do not anticipate that there will be brokers required this year. We have uh, publicly reported our position. Uh, we still have a gap in the last quarter to make up uh, to ensure that we do break even. Uh, and I'm confident that we'll be able to do that. Um, so that is the position, and uh, I would certainly not expect there to be brokerage required this year. So at this moment, as reported to the board, as far as the board's aware, there is no requirement for brokerage? The board's working on the assumption that our management plans to be able to break even will come to fruition. As always, we, we are reporting our monthly position regularly to Scottish Government, um, but there is no plan in place to require brokerage. Half million is obviously repayable over three years, so that has to be factored into your plans. Mm -hmm. um, comment is made elsewhere that the current savings or the savings that are highlighted by the Auditor General, two thirds of them are non recurring. How, how are you going to manage to reconcile that with non recurring savings? You can't have non recurring savings <coughs> every year, otherwise, other, otherwise, they're not sustainable. How are you going to tackle that? We need to have a, uh, uh, we want to get into recurring balance, and indeed, if you turn the clock back to 2010, we've managed to get the board into recurring balance, uh, and that is where we want to be. What we need to do is to get sustainable service redesign to make sure that we get the balance of uh, our activity correct to take out, uh, to make sure that we get back into that position. Uh, you can't do that overnight. Uh, a lot of our redesign takes many years to uh, get the full benefits from with the uh, level of public engagement that we have to get involved in to get service change uh, agreed. Um, so we are, will require uh, to rely on elements of non-recurring until we get these recurring uh, elements coming back out. But we are, as a board, absolutely aware that uh, requiring high levels of non-recurring uh, funding is not sustainable. And so therefore we want to convert that to recurring as quickly as we can. And that's what our targets are. Is there a plan in place for this? Indeed. Uh, in fact, our board meeting meets tomorrow and we'll be looking not just at the plan for the, next coming, for the coming year, but for a 10-year period, which has got very significant levels of service change that we will need to be able to deliver. Obviously, we won't just work a 10-year plan. We've got a one-year plan, a three-year plan, and a 10-year uh, more strategic elements. But that is fully discussed in our board meeting tomorrow and is available. the papers for that are available online. And this 10-year plan, does that replace an existing plan? Uh, Is it an update of an existing plan? Uh, I mean, we, 
traditionally, and I've been around for a while, people have uh, been looking very much year to year. We have moved more in the last uh, few years, and certainly when resources are tighter, it's more important to make sure, and, and there's less availability to use existing resources to fund change. Uh, so you, the, the, the reliance on longer term plans is essential. We've got a number of longer term plans for parts of our business, uh, whether it's the adult social care element, whether it's a acute care, whether it's primary care, and we just need to make sure that those are refreshed. So this is a, 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 a refresh of those plans, but it's building on the work we've been doing in the past. Isn't it going to be very challenging to achieve the non-recurring savings? I mean, I'm looking at uh, paragraph 12 of the Auditor General's report, where in 2013-14, 11.4 million were non-recurring. How sustainable is that? Um, I, it, it, we would... It's far more sustainable to get recurring savings and therefore you get into uh, financial balance. Off a budget of three quarters of a billion pounds, there's always going to be elements of uh, non-recurring elements that arrive. What is the acceptable level of non-recurring uh, of a three quarters of a billion budget? I think it would probably be about five, six million personally. Um, and if that's being achieved, uh, I, I think that's probably a level that would be uh, recognisable. We certainly want to half at least what uh, we're currently using. And that will be our plan. And that is our plan going into next year. So we're looking to reduce our dependence on uh, our non-recurring savings in line with the Auditor General's advice. We think that's good advice. We absolutely need to do that, and that will help us into the next financial year. OK, moving on to, through the Auditor's report. When it comes to the section on financial management, uh, paragraph 6, NHS Highland was forecasting it would break even at the end of the financial year, and the monthly reports to the board forecast break even. But the actual figure was showing significant overspends. How, how, can that, how can that be? I think this is where some of the, the, the confusion, or some of, I think the board is absolutely clear about this. We know that at the start of the year what our financial position is, uh, and if we're going to achieve break even, what level of savings we have to find in that year. So we report that our, we anticipate to break even, but that is assuming that we will make savings of a certain amount during that financial year. We also have plans in place to achieve those savings. Those plans get crystallised during the year. So we'll know we want to achieve certain level elements of saving, for example, within the acute uh, hospitals. We'll want to make certain elements of savings within uh, uh, primary care. And we will know what those plans are. And our uh, operational units will be scrutinising those plans to make sure that deliverable and acceptable is that we go as we go on. So what we're reporting is here's the scale of the, the challenge that we face in terms of the saving that we have to make to break even, and here are the plans that we have in place to achieve that, and here is what we've delivered in relation to those plans. So, for example, in August last year, we reported to the board that uh, we, uh, we still required to make around £10 million of saving in the remainder of the financial year. Publicly reported, absolutely clearly stated, and we had plans in place to do those. And Indeed, they were carefully scrutinised, not just by ourselves, but were reported widely in the local press. This was not something that was being done in any way secretively by the board. But the Auditor General says that the, there were insufficiently detailed plans about bridging the gap between the deficit and the forecast break-even. Um, I accept if they had been sufficiently detailed and robust, then we wouldn't have required brokerage at the end of the financial year. So I accept that as a statement. Uh, what I also have to say, however, is that you know, in the, if you look at the history of NHS Highland, we have delivered break-even uh, historically year after year after year after year. Um, the, this last financial year is uh, an exception for us. It's the first time, as I say, in 10 years uh, at least. I don't know, what, I don't know if, even if we have required brokerage, but certainly in the 11 years I've been chair, it's the first time. So we believed that we had robust plans in place. We were making ourselves as board members looking at those plans, we were making the judgment as to whether those were robust enough to deliver. Now clearly on that occasion in that year they were not or we would not have required brokerage. However, I don't think that, you know, that, again, the scale of it, having started the year with over £20 million worth of savings to make sure we broke even and requiring £2.3 million of brokerage, a lot of our plans worked. Just moving on to uh, Paragraph 8 of the Auditor General's report. 
there is a statement here that poor financial management was a major factor in NHS Scotland needing brokerage. Rigmore Hospital was part of it, but it does appear that poor financial management generally was an issue. Would you agree? I, I, I have to agree. I mean, we would not have required brokerage if we'd had sufficient financial management. We were, we're, we're looking at a budget of over three quarters of a billion pounds with hundreds of cost centres, with uh, lots of independent contractors and lots and lots of uh, um, individual managers managing budgets. It's our responsibility as a board to make sure that there are sufficient plans and controls to make sure all of those deliver so that we deliver overall break-even. Last year, that was not sufficient. And I am absolutely certain, uh, saying, telling you that that's not acceptable to my board. We're revising our controls and our planning to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And so we have, but we, I can do nothing else other than accept that they weren't sufficient in the last year. The responsibility for that lie? It lies with the board. Uh, the board is charged with the responsibility of making sure that we break even uh, and that we have uh, controls in place. I don't want to go in, uh, into uh, you know, micro detail over uh, all of the, but I, but I will and, I'm, and can if I'm happy of, of where the, the under and overspends uh, across our whole budget were during that period of time. But can, can I also just in connection with that, there was a follow up report by the internal auditor in May 2014 highlighting a lack of progress with the recommendations of the 2013 report. How did that come about? Uh, we asked for those reports. Uh, Why weren't they implemented? We had a change in the management team within Ragmore, which allowed us to, we believe we've got much more robust management in Ragmore. Um, but during that period of change, it was not possible to implement the full level of uh, management actions that we would have wanted to, to do. So it wasn't until January 14, that we managed to get that new team in place uh, who had really worked out themselves and uh, with the support of the Director of Finance, Chief Executive and others, uh, the extent of the controls that were required and put in place the new management uh, regime which we are confident will deliver uh, per, per, uh, the performance that we require. The auditor in paragraph 15 reports that NHS Highlands financial position will remain challenging for the next five years. Uh, that's assuming that you get your breakout even situation where you're going to get your re re recurring savings and even then there's other challenges to face. Um, are you satisfied that the planning process you have in place, the financial controls you have in place at this moment are sufficiently robust to take you forward given all the challenges, and I'm specifically uh, referring to paragraph 15 of the Auditor General's report here, I, uh, yes, I mean, I, I meet regularly with all of my colleague chairs uh, in NHS Scotland, and there's none of them telling me that there's anything other than challenging, it's going to be challenging for us. Um, I, I am confident uh, there's been good news in relation to the acceleration of the uh, bringing us up to the level that we should be getting with our NRAC share, which will be good news for us, which is additional resources, which will help us. Um, and, but I am absolutely confident that the approach that we are taking to eliminate waste, to focus on uh, the quality of care for for individual patients and uh, the, the, the public that require our services will deliver the uh, sustainable NHS Highland in the future. My last question, just a, a, one specific. Agency staff, 83% increase in the cost of agency staff between 2012-13 and 2013-14. Are we still relying very heavily on agency staff? Clearly it's a, a, a substantial element in the budget. It is. It's, uh, we, we still do, and we look to eliminate it as much as we possibly can by getting substantive positions in place. Uh, there are times when agency staff uh, are very useful to help you with through peaks and troughs. There's times if you are making change, it's good not to fill uh, posts on a permanent basis until you reconfigure the service the way you want it. But that level is far too high. It is not uh, a good place to be. Level? It, uh, no, it has come down, and it's something that we're managing. I don't know if you've got any specifics on that. Yes, the, um, if, if I may, the locum cost, particularly as part of the um, agency costs, 
uh, were full year effect in 13 14, the year we were talking about of 9.7 million. We recognise absolutely that we have some of the highest costs on loca locum and agency staff in Scotland, and um, that's really due to three areas. One is that it's difficult to recruit some specialised doctors, and I welcome the opportunity to discuss that in more detail with the, the committee this afternoon. Um, so those are particularly hospital doctors and some links to training numbers in the UK. The generalist jobs in our rural general hospitals also are not as attractive as they were. Uh, there is a one in three on call for those posts, and those are very difficult to sustain. So we are still now having to replace those posts with locum doctors. And there is a role for the board to take on, and we have to take on responsibility if we're unable to recruit GPs, general practitioners, to practice. And therefore, we've had a number of practices in the last 12 months where we've had some difficulties. So, for example, um, nearly half a million pounds cost for maintaining a salaried GP in a team up in Thurso. So all of those things we're working on absolutely to try and reduce our reliance on locum costs and the vast expenditure on that. Um, but there are some challenges for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, this is not a court of law, although it may feel like that. It's, uh, we normally at all at the same level. So I know your, your necks are all cricking here, but that's just the way it is. Um, I wonder if I could just ask a number of factual questions in relation to the, uh, to the Auditor General's uh, report. Um, firstly, uh, in relation to the uh, financial challenges you had in the financial year we're discussing, these were, as, as the report suggests, mainly due to an overspend on the operating costs for Rigmore Hospital. Is that true? was a significant proportion of what, it, yes. What's significant in that sense, Mr Coots? Uh, what percentage? A percentage for Reg Moore was probably about... Uh, I'm actually... Yeah, they spent at Reg Moore for, last financial, for the year 2013-14 was £9.6 million. Yeah, but, but the, when it says significant, was it 75% of the problem? Was it 90% of the problem? What, what's what in, t in terms of the costs of the rest of the board? The, the overall overspend was, if you ignore the brokerage, £2.5 million. So it, it was in excess of the brokerage figure. So in, in effect, the rest of the board was... Collectively, we've yeah. underspent. So it was Rigmore was the problem? Yes. It, it was the, the key problem. There were yeah. other pressures, but yes, that's correct. Uh, and, and Mr. Goods has already accepted that, as the Auditor General says, there were weaknesses in the financial management at the hospital. So it was the hospital where the problems were rather than the rest of the board. Is that fair to say? Or the rest of the board's functions? Yes, largely, yes. Um, and as Mr. Beatty's been asking, an internal audit report in April 20, 2013 about Rigmore highlighted several weaknesses in governance, including budgetary control. That's fair, correct? Absolutely. Uh, and a follow-up report of May 2014 highlighted a lack of progress. Again, as Mr. Beatty's been asking, that's correct and fair? Not sufficient progress. There had been progress, but not sufficient. Indeed. Okay, do you want to just say what that, what yeah, your I mean, take when, is that? I mean, when we got the, the, the report from, uh, and, and, uh, the original report, there was a lot of training that was put in place with individual budget holders around their individual uh, uh, budget management. Uh, and that is work which is paying off. Um, there were other issues. I mean, the board had called the, uh, one of the committees of the board, the Improvement Committee, which is also held in public, which scrutinises under performance, had regularly asked for the management actions that were proposed in relation to Reg Moore to make sure that we were going to be able to see the improvement we were looking for, and there were management plan plans in place. These did not turn out to be as well founded as we had anticipated. Uh, we have seen, as I said, change in the senior management team within Reg Moore, um, and we are now seeing seeing, uh, we be I believe, and we will continue to use internal audit to uh, back up our assumptions, I believe we've now got a much better regime and a much better uh, process in place to make sure that we've got over that problem. But in hindsight, given we are discussing a report that's about something that happened in a previous financial year, do you feel, particularly as the chairman, that the board, the, the board members, the non-executive board members, really challenged your executive team hard enough on all these factors? Yes, I, I, think, I, I think we did. I mean, we've got three committees, sorry, two committees plus the audit committee, plus the board that scrutinises it. And we do get the plans that are coming in and, uh, around each of the areas where uh, savings are being tended, and they are challenged um, when we see whether the impact of that management action is on 
uh, is as predicted, uh, then we, if it's not sufficient, and indeed in Reg Moore's case, we saw during the year management actions that were being detailed for us, they were not delivering the scale of the savings that we wanted, and we were asking for those to be revised. We did have particular issues in Reg Moore, uh, which made it harder for us to put in uh, uh, the strength of management actions that we would have wanted and we would have done in other areas. Uh, I don't want to go into details about that here. I think as well, sorry, I was just going to add, um, the follow-up report that we did in May 2014 mm. was a report that was requested by the audit committee of the of the board. So it was the non-execs who were asking us to follow up on the actions from the previous so report. That's all very fair. About that's it. entirely fair. What I then can't understand is if the challenge was good enough, why the the wider public, because as you've said quite a lot, you're reporting all this in a, in a wider public sense, why the wider public were constantly being told that you were going to break even, everything was fine, and yet actually the position was that you weren't at all. You were running a deficit, well, and you were what, going to run a deficit right through the whole year. We absolutely did, and we reported clearly to the public that we believed we would break even with sufficient management actions to close the the gap uh, to, 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 to make sure that, that deficit was closed. And that is what we've said all of the way from August and it's, it's in, in August editorial in the P&J saying that we would have 10 million uh, gap if we didn't have the management actions that were there. You know, and you know, even in, in this one, Mary commenting on the fact that, you know, that we, we had to make those savings and Mary was quite rightly concerned that she didn't want to see those savings impact on patient care. And, yeah. Uh, Mary's, excuse me, sorry. Um, so, so, <laughs> so, so, you know, we were absolutely public that we still needed significant management action to be taken to make sure that we bridged that gap. Yeah, source of some regret then that the Auditor General found that the, there were no significantly detailed plans to support you know, the contention you've just made. I have to accept that they were insufficient. Now, again, I would ask you to, to, to bear into account about that th this was two and a half million gap that we had at the end of the financial year compared to the 20 that was uh, the opening position. So a, a huge amount of effort was made to close it. That the rest of the board managed to close that despite specific problems at Reg Moore, which resulted in a nine million, million under, uh, overspend there. So there was an awful lot of very good action by an awful lot of dedicated and committed execs to do that. I, but you're yeah, right. I yeah. wish we weren't here. Yeah. I wish we had bridged that last yeah. two and a half yeah. million. No, I get that, Mr. Coots. I really do get that point about the rest of the board. What I, I'm again slightly struggling with is if Ragmore was such a key problem for your board, then that to me as a chairman or as a board member would have been a standing item on the agenda. I'd been in on that every single board meeting all over the top of that because you knew that's where the problem was, didn't you? And it did appear on every single operational committee meeting, every single improvement committee meeting and every single board meeting that the, the figures in relation to uh, Ragmore were reported and all of those were in public. Yeah, okay. So when the Chief Executive and the Director of Finance met the government to discuss the brokerage, I, I presume that was to discuss the fact Ragmore was a financial hole in your plans and therefore you needed the brokerage money to, to uh, square that one off, so I think as Mr Kenton's already in, alluded to. Indeed, we've made it absolutely clear to the Scottish Government we had some concerns around the financial management in Ragmore Hospital. But when we met on the 13th of December, and that would have been our, our half-year review, we were discussing the risk of the Scottish Government around our break-even potential. Um, but at that point, we, were, we had a potential deficit of 6.5 million. And that position improved when we got to month nine. So we did have plans in month nine. We did not wish to secure brokerage at all because we understood that would cause us more difficulty, as Mr Beattie alluded to, in future years having to pay that back. So when we got to month nine, that's the December 13 figures, we were then forecasting a £5.6 million pound um, forecast deficit and we reported that to the February board with some elements to close that gap and I, I think Mr Scott that's what you're trying to ask me and if I can just identify where those were we expected in the last quarter of the year for Ragmore Hospital to be able to uh, show an improvement of a million pounds in the event that wasn't the case but that was our plan at that point we were securing an additional million pounds from at that time the Highland Council we expected a benefit of two million pounds from uh, asset lives that my colleagues can discuss in more detail and the remaining 1.6 million we were looking for um, from further management actions looking at vacancies 
or additional procurement benefits. So we were comfortable on the 4th of February that we still had plans in place which would deliver the financial break-even. When we then had the month 10 figures, that was January 14, published on the 18th of February, then we found, and I was expecting us to be around a forecast position then of about £4 million, we found that Ragmore had moved to its detriment of 400,000 rather than improved its position. And that clearly then proved to be a significant risk to our financial balance plan. Okay, and just in terms of my last point here, you said very helpfully that you reported that discussion from December to the February board meeting to the February board meeting about a discussion that happened in December. No time prior to December was the board formally told you were entering into negotiations yes. over brokerage? We were not entering into negotiations around brokerage at that time. We did not enter into negotiations until much after the, I'd received then the month 10 figures. So when did brokerage negotiations formally so the begin? the discussion around brokerage, I asked the uh, Director of Finance to open the discussions with the Scottish Government after those month 10 figures became available. Which were January? Us. So that would have been after the 18th of February, Mr Scott. Into March? Into March. Right. Yes. OK, thank um, you. Can I just, can I just, also, so just, just briefly just yeah. also be clear that although uh, the, the, the figures weren't of it, at the board meeting, they were at the committee meetings within the cycle. So the, the uh, Improvement Committee and the Operational Committee units would have had those figures. Okay. Um, uh, can I first of all say a Section 22 report is a very, very serious report. The last one, there hasn't been one in my four years on this committee. This is a very serious situation. This committee has not been in Inverness as the convener said, for 10 years, and that was when the college uh, was overspending. C can I go back to the convener's opening point? NHS Highland agreed to the factual accuracy of this Section 22 report, agreed with the auditors from Audit Scotland sitting behind you. The report states, and this is a report that you have agreed to, the Chief Executive and the Director of Finance, Elaine Mead and Nick Kenton, discussed the board's financial position with the Scottish Government in December 2013, but did not formally advise the board at that time about the possibility that NHS Highland might not break even at year end. Do you agree with that? Because I, I think what I'm hearing, what you're saying to my colleagues, you tend to be muddying the waters from that point. Do you agree that you discussed the financial position with the government in December 2013, but you did not formally advise the board at that time that NHS Highland may not break even? Ms. Mead. So I did absolutely discuss with um, the Scottish Government on the 13th, as, as I've described to Mr Tavish. We were not discussing or seeking brokerage at that point, Ms Scanlon, at all. What were you discussing? We were discussing our plans and the risk to our plans for a break-even at the end of the year as part of our half-year review with the Scottish Government. Do you think you were overconfident in your recovery plan? Audit Scotland tended, as Colin Beattie said, uh, found insufficient uh, uh, recovery plan, uh, weaknesses in your recovery plan. Uh, were you confident with the government, but perhaps not so confident with your own recovery plan? We were confident with the government and we were confident with our own plan, should it have all gone to plan. But why were we, you confident in December, but you had to ask for money in February? It's because, only eight weeks. Because of the changes in the month 10 position that were then reported from particularly Rake Moore. And there was a difference. There were two items that were different to us at that point. One was a £400,000 deterioration on the Rake Moore position, which we had anticipated would be an improvement. And in addition, we'd also had a reduction on the expected amount we would get from the asset lives work. And those two things together made me recognise that we were unlikely then to be able to deliver break-even without support. And you did not anticipate either of these uh, spending requirements? At that point, we did not. And we also had 
invited an independent uh, assessor to come in and review our position, Douglas Griffin, who was the previous Director General, uh, sorry, Director of Finance for Greater Glasgow and Clyde, who looked at that point over December time, who looked at our plans, um, interrogated us, discussed with us our position, spoke to colleagues who are now the new management team in Ragmore Hospital, and was able to give us some confidence in the way forward and he himself felt that if the way forward went to plan then we would break even and so that was at that point in various time. health boards in Scotland most of the opening statement was about the brokerage uh, other health boards have received brokerage but not other uh, other health boards apart from Orkney have not been told so often that they are poor financial management so is that the reason that you're sitting here today and do you feel that you have overcome all the criticisms and that you're now on a path forward with a recovery plan and not requiring brokerage in future we for this year? absolutely accept the um, comments from the Officer General and fully accept the Section 22 report, Ms Gannon. OK, well, let's go back to the Press and Journal uh, who have been very diligent in covering this. Um, Elaine Mead, 3rd of December, and this is before the government intervention, Elaine Mead was absolutely confident at breaking even at the end of the financial year. Uh, the government money came forward on the 12th of January, and the board papers for tomorrow, following an injection of £6 million, you were confident on the 3rd of this absolutely confident 3rd of December you would break even. £6 million government money, I think you're using £3 million this year and £3 million next. And the board are only, only just £2 million short. That's the paper for tomorrow. So what this committee is looking for, we want to be confident that you are in control and we no longer have poor financial management at NHS Highland. I'm certainly still very, very concerned. I am not confident at this point that you are in control. I think it's very important that we recognise that NHS Highland has got a very, very, very good track record of delivery. Now, last year, in terms of our uh, requirement of brokerage, is the first time in over 10 years that we've uh, looked for that. I don't know when the last time was that we had to do it. And I don't think it's uh, accurate to, to look at just one snapshot, which is important. We're not complacent about it. We are absolutely not complacent about it but we're putting everything in place to make sure that we get this right for the people of the Highlands The point is that brokerage is not the point uh, and NRAC uh, is not the point, there are other health boards that have been underfunded so other health boards require brokerage other health boards have been funded below their target funding what is important here and the reason that we're here today is because Audit Scotland saw fit to draw NHS Highlands accounts to the attention of the Audit Committee in the Parliament because of poor financial management. So the brokerage is not the point. The brokerage was to fix a problem. The main point is the poor financial management. I want to leave here today hoping that we don't have to come back and say what you're doing this year and next. I'm looking for that confidence. I've not got it yet. Perhaps it would be useful if I explain some of the things that we've put in place mm -hmm. since uh, last, the end of last financial year. I'll, I'll, I'll let me yeah. just give you one example. Succinct and I will give you uh, one example, which is the uh, programme board, which was established to look at specific pieces of work across NHS Highland. Uh, in the past, these were reported at a very high level to us. Uh, now we have these reported in significant detail with non-executive directors who have got project management experience sitting on that programme board with our executives and them coming back to the board. That is an, a, a, a significant uh, improvement in the way that we, we do it and they've been reporting all year and will continue to do so. So I think we have learned the lessons, we have put these in place Place. And if you want details about how we have learned, then we can do that. Well, I, th I think uh, one of the points is the completely and utterly unfounded claims uh, of, of this committee. We would be failing in our duty as a parliamentary audit committee were we not to respond to Audit Scotland Section 22 report. Can I convene or just uh, highlight one or two points from your internal audit from NHS Highland? Uh, 
um, sorry, a recommendation to improve the timeliness of financial information, so that wasn't being done. Secondly, uh, financial management issues uh, directly caused the need for a brokerage, could have been avoided, uh, so that wasn't done. Uh, within the report, NHS Highland, uh, yeah, you're going to make financial reporting more robust going forward. Uh, these are promises made by you. Issues partly due to poor financial management, and you could have been clearer about the assumptions made and related risks. So, you know, what I'm looking for is an acknowledgement of that the Section 22 report on poor financial management is accurate, that these have all been remedied going forward. And can I just say, Gary, you've been chairman for 11 years. Well, I've been in here since 1999, and I remember discussing with your predecessor, Caroline Thompson, the high percentage of non-recurring savings that Colin Beatty raised. That was an issue over 10 years ago, and you are still the highest by far in the whole of Scotland. So I'm trying to find this confidence of addressing poor financial management, and I need that from you today. OK. Um, if you want details of all of the steps that we have taken, I can do that, but I can't do that briefly. I'm also quite happy to ask for the Director of Finance and yeah, others yeah. To, to come forward with details. Yeah. There. Can well, I just... If we can just, in terms of that, it would be really helpful to get information, and if we can respond in correspondence, that would be really helpful. I'd be very happy to. In relation to the non-recurring element, uh, when you had those discussions, at the time that I became Chair of NHS Highland, we'd had extraordinarily high levels of uh, non and we brought it down to zero. As a board, we brought it down to zero. 62%. It's currently Sorry, 62%. we brought it down to zero in 2010? 2009-10. 2009-10, we had it down to zero. It has increased again, and that is something which uh, there are a number uh, of reasons for it. Uh, um, Trying to make the changes that we are doing uh, requires us to use elements of uh, non-recurring, but the board knows that that is not the position that it wants to be in and has plans to reduce those as well. So uh, it is not true to say that for all of that period of time we've had the highest level of, of non-recurring because we did bring it down to zero and it has accelerated again. It was raised in the NHS overview uh Audit Scotland's overview of the National Health Service in Scotland. It was raised. Colin Good morning. Uh, I'm actually intrigued as to how you decide to uh, uh, what to decide which items go onto formal board papers and what's acceptable to be discussed at informal board uh, meetings of the board. Uh, the there. The board will make all decisions, so any requirement for decision making will be made fully and publicly at a board meeting, uh, or at its de what it delegates to its committees, which are also public uh, meetings. The board will also have the formal performance reporting, whether it's in financial or whether it's in activity. It will also have the clinical governance reports around uh, health uh, infection control, etc. So we'll have all of those that are absolutely raised at the uh, board meetings in public. The board will meet in uh, the, the board informally meets, uh, as is advised by good governance practice, uh, to make sure that it has its own training, its own development, that it understands fully uh, new initiatives that are taking place in healthcare, uh, so that it's it's in, in enlightened there, and they will look at things that are not requiring decision, but may well become issues in the next six months, nine months, five years, so that we can. Uh, be appraised of things that are in development. Uh, but I can assure you, and I've been around committee meetings for a heck of a long time in the public sector, there are no secret meetings, private meetings, that are making decisions about the activity of NHS Highland. Mm -hmm. So it's the board that makes the decision as to, as, as to what is on the agenda? Oh, yes. The agenda is the ultimately, mm -hmm. the, the agenda is the chairs. Yeah. OK, well, allowing for that, do you think there really does meet expected standards of public accountability particularly in terms of discussing financial uh, arrangements uh, and the position at informal meetings, when there's no opportunity for public assurance that effective scrutiny is taking place? 
all of the financial reporting goes to our public meetings, whether it's the operational units or the board. So I'm thinking in terms of the, the comments in the, uh, that we've heard earlier from the likes of the convener, and I think it was Mr Scott as well, uh, about, about the fact that the, uh, the informal meetings, the, 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 the difficulties that uh, have been shown by those people who have asked questions earlier, it didn't come across very clearly at uh, uh, public meetings. There was very little in the way. Uh, we wouldn't be here if we didn't think it was a problem. And I've sat on boards before, so I know exactly what I would expect. And there is criticism of your board for the actions that you've taken. Last, uh, I, I've, I've met with the Auditor General and with our auditor. And uh, I think that, you know, and I, I, I take responsibility for this entirely myself. Last year, we had a change in the audit team in Audit Scotland. Um, if it had, it was, so it went from one team within Audit Scotland to another team in Audit Scotland. The previous team, we'd been working with them for years. They had worked with us about our governance reviews and the way that we uh, planned our governance. If we'd had a complete change of order, if we'd gone to a, another firm of accountants to become our external auditors, then I would undoubtedly have got very close to them to make sure that they, there was absolute understanding about the way that our governance worked and the interrelationships between all of our committees and the board and the way that they were, had delegated responsibility. I didn't do that when there was the change of the audit team within Audit Scotland. I have now spoken to the Auditor General and indeed uh, Stephen, our uh, internal auditor, and I want to make sure that we we have those meetings so that there is clear understanding about the way that all of our committees and our governance work together. Um, and it may well be, I, I certainly believe that we have as transparent and as open governance and reporting of financial matters as any organisation that I have worked with. Um, and I am confident that that is the case. Um, and I'm more than happy to discuss that in, uh, uh, further with our auditors. And if there's improvements to be made, we will always make them. Well, given the fact that you appear to have accepted there was uh, some problems, why would any member of the public sitting here, if they were in here today, um, take your word that things are going to change if, they have, if there have been problems before? What, what can you say to the general public, not just this committee, that actually says things will change, accountability will change, financial problems will be seen and discussed fully at the board, reported at the board, and they can have some degree of uh, uh, happiness that uh, you're on top of the game. I am saying that through our publicly reported board meetings and publicly reported committee meetings, that, the bo that we are absolutely transparent about our position. And I think that the timeline for reporting and I think that the report from our internal auditors about the way that we report in public should give you a lot of confidence about that. If there are improvements to be made, then we will be more than happy to continuously look at them. In the last 18 months, we've started uh, webcasting our board meetings so that more people get the opportunity to be able to scrutinise what we do. Um, and that, um, we were, are, are always going to look for ways to improve it. I would also ask members of the public to look at our performance over time. Um, we have, uh, I believe in NHS Highland, a very, very good track record uh, over a, a long period of time of delivery. And uh, we have a very, very good satisfaction rates looking at the people that actually use our services and to comment on the way that we, uh, the way that we deliver. Um, I am absolutely committed to working with our local public to give them what assurance and what uh, comfort we can, and we'll look for ways that we can continue to do that. Can I just, uh, okay, David Torrance. I'll, sorry, sorry but briefly, please. I'm just going to add a, a point. One of the main issues, uh, one of the main reasons we did our, uh, our most recent review, internal audit review, was to look at this whole aspect of how well informed were the board, the board kept by management on the financial position, and uh, it was it's. It came through very clearly from our, and we met with a lot of the non-exec board members, from our reviews of the board papers and from discussions with uh, the non-execs, that they were kept fully informed of the financial position uh, all the way through 13, 14, and continue to be kept well informed of the financial position. Um, one, of the, so one, of the, uh, one of the issues that was raised was about these informal board meetings. What we're really talking about in terms of informal meetings are board development sessions. So these, these are meetings of the full board where all of the non-execs are there, all of the exec members are there, senior management are there, but they're not official board meetings. But they're pretty formal meetings 
It was accountability and, and public accountability I'm interested in. I'm not doubting, perhaps, that the information wasn't put forward. I'm talking about the public accountability and how public can have confidence that the information that goes in the board agendas are discussed fully in the board agendas. I, I, th I think it's going to be unhelpful for panel members to recycle comments that have already been made. Can we keep them as succinct as possible? And I want you to have the opportunity to respond, and I want questions as well. Okay, Mary Scanlon, very briefly, and then David Thomas. I, I just wanted to, uh, to say that the, when the Auditor General came to the Audit Committee in the Parliament, uh, when this report was presented, I quote from the Auditor General, one of the reasons why the report on NHS Highland is before the Committee is that the way in which the situation was handled means there is no formal record of papers to the Board or minutes of decisions taken. That is not acceptable audit practice. Would you agree? That's the Auditor General's comments from official report. No formal record of papers to the board or minutes of decision taken. So you can be as informal as possible, but as Colin Keir said, you are accountable to the public for three quarters of a million pounds and the effective delivery of a high-quality health service. So secrecy is not acceptable here. And there isn't any secrecy. I accept... No formal can I just, record... Can I Finish my comment, please. I accepted entirely what Mr. Martin said earlier on, that we accept the report in the Section 22 report. The comments that you've just read out are not in the Section 22 report. They were the Auditor I, General. I, I, Mary, I understand that. I accept, Mrs. Scanlon, that that is what the Auditor General said. I do not, not agree. If you look at all of our public agendas and minutes and discussions that took place, go back and look at the webcasts that are still available online, you will see that those issues were fully discussed at our public meetings, absolutely categorically. Can we just clarify, I think it's important for the record, that that actually has included the statement that Mary read out is in the report. So, so That's in the, the, the record yeah, of yeah, the... Sorry. Can you refer me paragraph, to that, please? Yeah, paragraph 7 of the report. In paragraph 7, um, it, if you just... did not formally report the brokerage agreement... Exactly. ...to the board... Until but, the end of the financial but you've, year. we've already discussed that the brokerage was only discussed in March. Okay. So there, you know, it would, it, it, that was when it was discussed with government. So that specific comment about brokerage and the discussions took place in March. What was being questioned by Mr. Kerr was around the routine reporting and the routine insurance that performance was properly scrutinised by the committee, by our board, and it was. Okay. Uh, David Tons. Um, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. I think Mary Scanlon covered most of this section. I was going to ask questions on there. But um, referring back to the board development sessions, do you think it's good management practice that um, there is no records, there is no minutes for the boards for these uh, development sessions? Uh, I think there's probably two or three things uh, I'd say there is that um, I would, and w it, following the publication of this report, I will now ensure that at every board meeting, uh, the topics that have been discussed informally will be minuted in our, our formal meetings um, and a note uh, of what those, those topics are. So we'll make sure that, that is the case. Um, they, they, we recently, as a board, about uh, 14 months ago, we had a, uh, an expert on corporate governance uh, who ran a training session, a development session, which we do continuously within the board. And they were very clear that there is very good practice to make sure that the board can get together uh, informally, just in terms of team dynamics and making sure that they operate effectively together as a team. And we will continue to do that. But in terms of publicly reporting that that's taking place, then yes, I will make sure that happens. Um, thank you, Mr. Coots. Could you reassure me and the general public that, in the word you used yourself, transparency will now take part um, for everything that you cover? Absolutely. I, 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 I am... I am confident that we are transparent and have been transparent about the publication of our performance to date and about whether it's financial or whether it's activity uh, performance. We do publish that in public and decisions uh, and discussion around that takes place in public. Uh, I'm sorry that there is a perception that uh, 
important things take place out with those uh, formal board meetings. They don't. They take place at those meetings. And I give an absolute assurance around that. And I will make sure that by formally record, recording the other occasions that, boards, that the board meets informally, whether it's for training, whether it's for development, whether it's to take advice from some of our clinical experts or whatever, we will record that. Can I say thank you? No further questions, Cadena. Can I just ask on the issue of the informal development sessions that were referring to and the advice that you were given uh, from corporate governance, did they suggest that an issue such as serious as uh, you know, negotiating possible brokerage with the Scottish Government was the recommendation that you received from the corporate governance organisation or the, the advisors that we should discuss something like that on an informal basis? We didn't. We didn't. The, 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 the decisions, first of all, we were having a training session about general governance principles and how, which is something that I think all boards re uh, refresh themselves on uh, regularly. So we had that regular session, which again, and we had a discussion about um, the, the development sessions and how they were applied. There was no specific discussion about particular items, but the, uh, there was no... Um, the board is fully f aware of the process that if towards the end of the financial year there is a, a, an increased risk that you're not going to close that gap, then there's going to be discussions between our chief executive and directors of finance and uh, Scottish government. We don't have an option not to break even. So that, that, you know, so that if so that we were absolutely, the board was fully aware that those discussions would be taking place. I understand the board were consistent, obviously, as you're advising, there were some issues concerning the budgetary challenges that faced. And those discussions probably take place with boards across the country, but the word brokerage was never discussed at that informal session. Uh, so so no, none of the board members will write to us informally or formally, or you know, and no, nobody will provide any evidence to us from the board to suggest that there was any discussion, not that informal discussion, about the, what, the possibility or the, the negotiations that were taking place in connection well, with brokerage. There was discussions taking place, not negotiations. At the time that we, we met as... Brokerage was mentioned. Yeah, the, the, yeah. And one of our board members, who had previously served on a board uh, in another part of the UK, which had regularly required brokerage, asked whether it would not be sensible at that stage to, to look to, to brokerage, rather than continuing to try and find the savings in in the last financial year. So that was at a, a session that was, uh, so that suggestion was put forward at the session. That's the only recollection that I have of a discussion uh, that specifically was on the brokerage rather than on the requirement to break even. So can I just, before I bring Nigel Don in, just on that point about, look, I mean, because we're trying to picture this, this informal development session that took place and the kind of discussions that took place, because we understand that development will take place, we understand that good governance is that you should have, on some occasions, informal discussions. But was there any reference to that informal development session at any further point when the board were discussing the possibility of brokerage? So did anybody say, well, we actually discussed this at the informal session, so that means that we've debated that and we've discussed that with the board then? Um, so it was never used as a reference point of, yeah, we've discussed this issue with and the board. It, and it wasn't, no, not, not, in, not in that terms as far as I can, I mean, I'm trying to be very careful here because I, I, I don't want to do anything that misleads the board. The discussions that took place about our wish, our, our desire, our activity, our, our efforts to achieve break-even during the financial year were all substantially, the substantive discussions took place at our board meetings. And at that stage, and at no time was the board uh, uh, discussing the requirement to break, uh, to, for brokerage until we got the January 10 figures uh, in February and the, we had told our Chief Executive and our Director of Finance at the January meeting that they had to take whatever action was required to make sure that we broke even. That was both in relation to finding savings and inevitably at that stage in the financial year the formal discussions with the, gov uh, with the government over brokerage in the uh, March. Okay, Nigel Dunn. Thank you very much, Convener, and good, good morning, colleagues. I'd like to address the issues around Regmore Hospital, if I may. Um, I note that your internal report mentions a figure of eight and a half million overspend. 
I have some other figures here from the Auditor General, which suggest in October we were talking about 8.2 for the financial gap for the whole board and 6 million for Regmore. I, I, I don't want to fight about those numbers because clearly they come and go from month to month. But it's clearly a significant operation. Uh, it has been identified as being a very large part of the deficit, which caused you a problem, uh, which we're talking about. I, I'm, I'm just wondering, given that any large operation has three costs, which are people, buildings, and consumables, and people are the staff, buildings you know about, and consumables are often medicines and, 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 and these kind of things in this context, how can your budget be anything other than fixed? How can you vary that in the context of a running medical operation, given that you need the staff, you need the buildings, and you need the medicines? How is that susceptible to financial management? I think there's a, a number of things which do provide opportunities to uh, generate efficiencies in the way that we work so that we can spend more of that money on direct patient care and care generally. Um, if you look at things like the way that uh, rotors for our consultant colleagues uh, are, 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 are developed to make sure that they are focusing on the work that only consultants can do rather than on work that perhaps other professionals who are not as expensive uh, can be doing. So that modernisation work to make sure that that's happening is taking place all the time. We are continuously looking to try and make sure that all of our prescribers are using generic uh, drugs and we've got initiatives where it's, it's possible and it's advisable and we've got initiatives across all of that and against other procurement as well. We want to make sure that all of our professionals, whether it's nursing or AHPs or doctors or healthcare assistants, are all working to the top of their, uh, top of their license rather than uh, doing things that could be done by other uh, people. So the workforce planning is absolutely essential. We want to eliminate waste. That's, that's the, the whole ethos of the way that we want to improve services in Highland is focused on eliminating waste. And that includes things about like making sure that we don't have uh, over-provision, that we're not reordering tests. Uh, the number of times that we have heard in the past where people come into hospital and just routinely a series of tests are carried out on them without referring back to whether those same tests were done the time before. So all of that stuff is stuff which creates efficiencies. The fact that we've seen a dramatic reduction in uh, bed days because we've reduced uh, infections within hospitals all makes savings that we can redeploy elsewhere. Um, and so that's, that's the way that we want to do it. Uh, okay, now, forgive me. You, you've given me some of the practical medical answers, pardon me, management answers, which I accept. Okay, and I'm conscious this is not the health committee and I'm not trying to turn it into that. But what I'm still unsure about is how those issues are subject to financial management. Because all you're actually going to do is add up the costs of the things that you've done. Financial management has to be proactive in deciding what you are not going to do in order to save money. But all the things you've talked about are things you're going to do anyway. Or, yes, and you're going to work out what the costs were afterwards. We're going to finan financially plan with our management to do them more efficiently. And that is what we have done over significant areas of our work over the last five years, and we will continue to do. We are, we are, the, the, if you look at the increase in activity that we are doing as an NHS board, it far outstrips any increase in financial resources that we have uh, received because we are doing things more efficiently and more effectively. And that is what we will continue to drive down. And we manage that financially as well to make sure that when we do make changes that we get that cash out and it's reinvested elsewhere. Right, but I'm, forgive me, convener, but I'm going to press this point because whilst I accept everything that you've said, I don't see that myself as financial management. All you're going to do is to add up the costs afterwards of what were good management decisions. But that's not financial management, that's people and buildings management. Actually, the costs are going to be whatever the costs are. Can, can I and, just mention something? That, what's one of the aspects of the internal audit review we did was, was to look at how that whole issue is dealt with in the hospital. So how do budget holders and service managers translate the activity that's going on in the hospital into a financial budget and financial position? And the, one of the difficulties is that we found was that there can be huge fluctuations in the cost base at the hospital because drugs, some drugs are very, very expensive and it's almost impossible or very difficult to predict 
how much of those drugs are going to be used from one year to the next. So actually developing a budget for that, for those drugs, is, is a difficult thing to do. Um, and in addition to that, the demand for services in general within the hospital is, is hard to predict. Um, but where there's an increase in demand, that has to be met with additional um, staff costs. So the hospital has to employ more consultant time to keep waiting lists down. But waiting lists are dependent on the demand for, for services within the hospital. So all of these, those things are the, are the key kind of financial management skills that budget holders need to be able to predict what that kind of demand is going to be and translate that into a financial budget. But there can be huge fluctuations in the costs of drugs and the costs of staff time because of uh, those demand issues. Yeah, I, I, I entirely accept that. I think I'm still going to stick to my point that that's not financial management, that is practical hospital management. And the finance is just the costs when you add it up. And the there's no financial things, management in anything that you've talked the, about. No, the two things are absolutely, in a, they, they can't be taken apart really, they are inextricably linked. You know, the, the management of, uh, of operations, of activity, has to be inextricably linked with financial management because there's no way that budget holders and service managers can make decisions on an operational basis without understanding what the financial implications, the budgetary implications of those decisions are. They have to link them together. That's, that's can absolutely I, financial management. Can I also add to that that at the start of every year, each of our, our operational units and each of our, each of our managers cascading down to budget holders knows exactly what their budget target is for, those, for, for that financial year. Um, so we, we, and we, we train them and support them and expect them to be able to manage their budget within that. Now, what we've seen in uh, a number of areas uh, where there is increased expenditure, increased activity, and we then have to be able to manage that from other areas. So that financial management is taking place on a day in, day, day, in, day out, and Elaine's team leads that. My final question then is, are you therefore confirming that there are things you don't do because you haven't got the money to do them? If you want to give us a lot more money, there are things that we would do. Um, but what we want to do is to make sure that we deliver uh, the health service that's, uh, that the government wants us to be able to, to deliver for our people. We, we are not, I do not, I believe that we can achieve that within the resource that we've got. Uh, but it does mean that we've got to completely redesign the way we do things and continuously improve the service uh, that we're working on. And that's what our Highland Quality approach is all based on. Yeah, uh, I'm going to allow for a brief suspension till 10.55, uh, no, by which time witnesses can come back and we'll be here until uh, 11.30. Okay, thank you. Just a brief suspension till 5.00. Okay. Again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, can I reconvene uh, from our earlier session and can I start with Mary Scanlon? Uh, thank you. One of the risks looking forward in the... Section 22 report from Audit Scotland, it's actually paragraph 14. The auditor has highlighted that the cost of delivering adult social care services in Highland continues to pose a financial risk to the board. And I thought as we had a few Highland councillors in the uh, gallery today, it was probably worth asking. I appreciate we're taking evidence later on, but uh, that's just a, a, a private session. This one's on the record. Uh, I was very supportive of the lead model. In fact, uh, NHS Highland and Highland Council have led the way in Scotland as far as integrated health and social care. Um, if it's a risk going forward, I think that's something many people would be worried about. Can you explain what the risk is and what's being done to address it? Uh, I think there are risks in any change that you embark upon. If you want to make transformational change in the way you do things, it is a risky process. Sometimes I feel that the easy thing to do is actually just to keep your head down and not make changes and be very conservative in the way that you run organisations, and that way perhaps you don't end up in this position here today. Um, however, I believe that we've got to change dramatically if we're going to have the sort of health and care system that we want 
for the future, that I want for myself in the future. And so therefore, I unashamedly uh, am a huge supporter of the work that the Highland Council and ourselves have done to uh, bring about that, that uh, level of change. And it is showing results. Um, as a lot of people in this room will know that a couple of years ago, one of the biggest challenges that we were facing was about getting uh, care at home services for people. We had an awful lot of people that were assessed as requiring care at home and were not getting packages of it. In the last couple of years, uh, working as an integrated team of healthcare professionals with social workers and social care professionals, we've now managed to reduce the, the, that, that deficit hugely, including by going to paying the uh, living wage to all home care workers uh, in Highland, whether they work for us or whether they work for the private sector or the voluntary sector. That's made recruitment and retention so much easier. Uh, now, we pay an increased fee for that, but that gets directly passed on to the workers that are doing that work, and therefore we have managed to turn that corner. But that takes time. And the work that we now want to move on to working with our care home providers, which will mean that we'll be able to get people who are currently uh, blocking beds in their hospitals out much more easily uh, into to, to care homes. Once we get that uh, uh working effectively, I think we'll be able to really show dramatic change. When we embarked on integration, the council and ourselves were right, quite clear that we would not see the full benefits of that for at least five years. Uh, that's been the lessons when we've looked at other places around the world that have tried this scale of change. That they're looking at five, ten years to get these real benefits. We're at least three years down that path. The rest of Scotland's got to start as yet. So it is challenging. We're managing it very closely, but we we think we'll get the benefits from it. Right. Well, it, it, is, it is a serious risk. And can I just go through some of the figures? Um, Scottish Government's allocated additional funding of £1 million in 2012-13 towards the integration, another million, uh, well, 12-13 and 13-14. The Council and the Board have agreed the Council will provide £4.5 million uh, this financial year, 4.3 million next financial year, and 4.7 the following year. So that's huge transfers from the Council. Now, I've personally always very much been in favour because I thought it would be the end of delayed discharge. In fact, delayed discharge is a serious problem here. Finding home carers is a serious problem, and I've raised with the Director General of Health about... Um, uh, Debbie Meekie and Nethy Bridge, one year in a hospital because they're in Ian Charles in Granton because there's no home carers. And I've recently visited uh, a care home uh, uh, over the Bewley Firth and um, they get seven phone calls a day asking for a placement. So what I had hoped would happen through the health and social care integration, and I'm still a huge fan I'm now concerned about delayed discharge, the lack of home carers, not enough residential care home places, and the fact that Audit Scotland are highlighting this as a risk going forward. And to be honest, you could take this and apply it to almost any health board in Scotland. But I was hoping for better uh, from NHS Highland. And in your answer, can you ask, I've heard what's coming from the council, but I thought the whole idea was taking resources from the acute sector out into the community. So perhaps in your answer, if you could address that. Okay. I'm delighted to do that. I'm going to bring Elaine in to talk about some of the specific numbers around delayed discharge and what it is people are waiting for to get them out of hospital. But let me just, you're, you're absolutely right. What you're describing in relation to increased costs for social care is happening across the country. Uh, you, you, we, we can clearly identify the increase in resources that uh, the Highland Council is giving in relation to adult social care in uh, Highland, but if you actually look at uh, local authority spending across Scotland on social care, it is also increasing. Now, the, the, I, I saw figures recently that was showing that there was uh, very, very substantial increases in social care to the detriment of other services that local authorities are running. So we're seeing cuts in other services, but social care is increasing. So it's not unique to us. Uh, I don't think that anyone in Scotland yet is able to be in a position to really talk about what is the appropriate level of spend for social care as we're going forward. That's work that we're looking for the JIT and others to, to work uh, um, with us on. In terms of a delayed discharge, 
uh, sorry, in terms of what we're taking out of hospitals, one of the major things we're taking out of hospital just now is geriatric care. We've just appointed an additional three geriatricians who are working in the community with GPs so that people don't end up in hospital. All the medical reconciliations, all of the uh, medical care is given to people in their own homes or in care homes, rather than uh, what would have happened would have been admissions. Now, the big pressure point we've got in Highland is actually care homes. Uh, as you know, uh, or as many people in this room will know, is that we've lost a lot of capacity in care homes. Uh, in other parts of the country, we've seen significant new developments, significant increase in numbers of care home provision. We've actually seen a reduction. The people who are currently delayed in Ragmore and our other hospitals are not people for looking for care at home, but it's care home places. Now, they are difficult to turn on and off. You've got to build the facility, you've got to staff it up, get it registered, etc. We're working with the providers to try and get that much more in balance, and I'm confident in the years to come we will. We've never pretended that we would turn around this position in a year or a couple of years. We've always said it would take time, and I'm confident that the track that we are on will deliver benefits. But Elaine, do you want to talk about the specific numbers and delayed discharge? Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I also just ask? You know, we're not the health committee, as Nigel Dawn said, but you know, one of the main reasons has been the shortage of home carers. We're looking at freeing up capacity in the acute sector, but I need you to address the point that Audit Scotland made in the Section 22 report continues to pose a financial risk going forward. That would be a worry to many people in the Highlands, and I'm just looking for an assurance today about what you're doing to address that. Rather than it's a problem elsewhere in Scotland, you're a step ahead of elsewhere in Scotland, and we've also brought in legislation in the Parliament to make sure all health boards do what you're doing. I had covered a lot of the things that we're doing to minimise that risk by the, the, the work that we're doing to ensure that we've got the care at home workers that we need, that by the work that we've done with the sector to make sure that they're getting paid. That you've got enough care at home workers and we nobody will stay in a hospital for a year we've, again. We've increased it dramatically and the big pressure point that we've got is actually care homes, not care at home. But Elaine, can you give us the figures? I, I can give you the figures for today with Scanlon and that's that we have 33 um, patients waiting as a delayed discharge in Ragmore Hospital and a significant proportion of those now will be waiting for care home placements and as the chairman describes that now is the pressing need for us. It, indeed we need to uh, develop the sector for care in the community and we have invested an additional... That has resulted in quite a few hundred patients from the Highlands having to go to Glasgow and elsewhere in Scotland because of the, those beds are taken up by uh, delayed discharge so, patients. So today there are 61 in total if I include the numbers in the community hospitals and what we're doing is increasing and developing that sector by um, supporting additional care workers working with schools as well as working with universities to develop vocational training for that sector and I think that will be necessary across the whole of Scotland but importantly to answer your question we have invested from health money an additional one and a half check me uh, one and a half million pounds this year um, into that sector to make sure we can support the flow of patients out of hospital into the community. And that's the critical transformational part of integration. That was cool. Yeah, uh, can I try a different line of questioning? I just wanted to understand internal audit in the context of how this has all gone uh, on and uh, the year in question that we're actually asking about. Um, I wonder, Chris Brown, if you could firstly say uh, how long you've been the internal auditor for Highland Council and who do you report to? The board, the chairman, the chief executive, who? We're in our fifth year now as internal auditors at uh, Highland Health, Health Board and we report to the audit committee. So that's a non-executive committee of the board. And on a monthly basis? On a monthly basis, we have uh, monthly liaison meetings with Nick Kenton, Director of Finance, and the Chief Operating Officer. Okay, and would those meetings include an assessment of the monthly financial position of, the, of NHS Highland? Uh, no, that's not what we're doing as internal auditors. We don't, we don't monitor the, the financial and position so on a monthly basis. Okay, and they wouldn't raise with you the, de the deficit or surplus position month by month? Uh, as to what's happening? Not, not routinely, they wouldn't, but they have raised that issue uh, in the past. So, so it was management who asked us to do the first review of Ragmore yeah. Hospital yeah. because they were concerned about the financial position within Ragmore, which was an issue that came up at one of those monthly yeah. liaison meetings. Yeah. So if it's not in your remit then, forgive me, but it, it, it's yeah. not, is, is internal audit not about um, assessing month to month what's financially happening within the, within the NHS Highland? 
No, not on a month-to-month -month basis. No, what we're doing is looking at the control frameworks, so the yeah. controls that are in place uh, within the NHS Highland to monitor the financial position. But, but so what gave rise to the? No, thank you for that. What gave rise to the uh, to the April 2013 report? I mean, did you, as an internal auditor, decided to commission that, or were you asked to commission it? We were asked to do the review um, by uh, the Director of Finance. Mm. So, um, so this is going back now a couple of years. Yes, obviously. apologise. But, uh, yeah. but no, at one of our uh, monthly liaison meetings, um, uh, Nick raised concerns around the financial position at Rigmore. So, yeah. you know, it had been known for a, for a year or two, I guess, by that point that, uh, that the hospital was overspending. Yeah. And there was a recognition by management that that was unsustainable, and they wanted to understand why that was happening. Yeah, and, and, from, and you produced uh, a report which highlighted governance and budget as the two main, I guess, the two, don't let me put words in your mouth, but the two main significant issues that needed to be addressed. Yes, it was, it was around... Um, the, main, the main issue was really a, a, the culture within the hospital. There wasn't a strong culture of, um, of very tight financial management within the hospital. And that was partly because I think... Um, up until fairly recently, the hospital had enough money to continue. And in 2010, as uh, the chairman said, the, the hospital was in recurring balance. Uh, so the, you know, there hadn't been, a, up until fairly recently, a need for very tight financial management. But there, you know, there has been over the last few years an increasing need because of increasing demand and increasing cost within the hospital, mm -hmm. a, a, a need for tighter financial management than, than, than existed. So things have just got a bit lax, just got a, bit, a little bit easy because money was okay and th no one was too worried about it? I think that people were making decisions, um, they were making decisions uh, for the best interests of, of patients in the hospital mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. without taking uh, enough recognition of the financial implications of some of those decisions. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the point that Nigel Don made, yeah. made earlier that you know, there, are, there can be major fluctuations in costs depending on the decisions that clinicians make within the hospital. Mm -hmm. And clinicians weren't being, I don't think, uh, weren't monitoring the budgetary implications of some of the decisions yeah. that they were making as closely as they could have been. But your report really found out that the, therefore there wasn't enough challenge of that from above, yeah. by which I from, guess the operational executive team and the board. From the hospital management team primarily, yes. But who's challenging the hospital management team? Who, who are they accountable to? Well, they'd be accountable to the central management team Indeed. within the health board and then ultimately yeah. the health board. And did you find itself. that that process just wasn't working effectively? Because to me that's one part of your recommendations that... Yeah, I mean, I think the, the governance and accountability wasn't as strong as it could be. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we had quite, made quite a few recommendations in that report to improve that, yeah. Yeah, and I'm grateful for that. And, and you then went on and found a year later and they hadn't made enough significant progress. I mean, as an internal auditor, you must have been pretty fed up with that, weren't you? Well, we're, again, we're, the audit committee asked us to do the follow-up review because they were concerned yeah. about the, the issues that were raised in the, the initial review. Yes. Uh, and um, th I think one of the challenges that the hospital management had was we're talking about a cultural change. So, you know, it's not just a case of changing a yeah. few controls Absolutely. and improving the situation. It's yeah. about changing the actual attitude of mind uh -huh. that the budget holders uh, had. And you know, these, are, these are budget holders who are primarily cl clinicians. Yes, who are making clinical Absolutely. decisions, and that's yeah. what they're trained to do and they're used to doing. Yeah. And we had, you know, the management, the hospital management had the challenge of trying to make them, you know, understand the financial implications of the decisions as well. Okay. So that takes a bit of time to do. No, that's very helpful. And can I just ask you also, um, did you, or were you asked at any stage to, to give a view on the need to go to the Scottish Government and ask for more money? Because we call it brokerage, but basically it's a, it's a bung of money to basically allow any health board to get through a, a position where they're in a deficit. Were you involved in any of that, in those discussions? No, I wasn't, no. And do you think internal audit should be? I mean, given that you're there to internally audit what's going on? <laughs> um, I mean, what we're, do, what we're asked to do is, is to look at the controls that are in place in the health board to manage the financial position. Um, and uh, so we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't expect to be asked for, you know, what tactics should management take. That's an operational management decision in terms of um, how to bridge a gap. So do we just stop, you know, do we just reduce services to, to stop spending money? Or do we ask for some more money to continue services at the existing level? That's, a, that's an operational management decision. And I guess a decision for negotiation with the Scottish Government that management took. And we wouldn't expect to be consulted on that kind of decision, no.
evidence. But just so I can be clear, during the course of that year, the year that we're, we're looking at, yeah. um, the, the internal audit function wasn't asked to keep a monitoring view on the financial position, given all these financial pressures that are now so evident from the Section 22 report. Um, no, we weren't asked to do that, no. Yeah. And, and, and that's not, we wouldn't expect to be asked to do yeah. something like that, because yeah. that's, that's, a ma that's basically a management job. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what we're doing is looking at the controls that are in place within the health board to do that yeah. job. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's great. Thanks very yeah. much. Mary yeah. Scanlon advised me that she's a 30 second question, so I'll have a lot to ask her. I was just sort of concerned that uh, you're concerned about clinicians making decisions in the best interest of the patient, but not taking into account the cost. So, do you feel that managers know best about what the budget should be and know best what would be in the best interest of the patient rather than the clinicians? No, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that at all. No, okay. the the, the, the clinicians see... and the managers need to work together. I think to to make decisions that are in the best in interest of the patient, but but then to understand what the financial implications. And of did the you feel that are. the clinicians and the management were not working together? Was that one of the issues yes, that you addressed? That was one of the issues that we identified. Okay, and yes. you feel going forward that that's that's, that's that has improved, I think, uh, dramatically you. within the hospital. Thank you. Yes. Okay, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. Several members uh, have touched on the, the question of these informal meetings, and I feel it's maybe been a little bit obscured by reference to training and development meetings, uh, which, which uh, are a little bit uh, different, I feel, to the point that's trying to be made. The question is, for, is it right that discussions on financial position should be taken at an informal meeting of the board members does that comply with the expected standards of public accountability? So you're looking at me, uh, Mr. Beattie. Um, it's your turn now. <laughs> the, uh, the, no, not, not if it was exclusively in informal meetings. No, absolutely not. Right. So, so if, if your question is, sh should those kind of discussions only take place in informal meetings? Absolutely not. Um, but I think the, the only reason from our review of the, of the papers that went to the board and to those meetings, that that discussion happened at an informal meeting was because a board meeting hadn't come round yet. So the board meetings all, all, you know, happen every couple of months. Yeah. Um, so you know, until the next board meeting, if there is an opportunity for management to inform the board members at an informal session of the financial position, then they'll take that opportunity rather, than, rather than wait until the next formal board meeting. Given the gravity of the situation, would it have been appropriate to have some sort of a, an emergency board meeting rather than wait for the normal cycle? Well, I, I mean, I... I, Can I so on that? that? The board had met uh, in December and it was following that position, that meeting, that the deterioration in the position which led to the view that uh, brokerage was uh, desirable took place. Now the discussions, now the board uh, at its public meeting knew that we, what we had to do, we had instructed our chief executive and director of finance to, that break even was essential um, and that they were working on that. Um, there was no, uh, and so when the discussions took place, uh, when we saw that those month nine figures that came out, and board members get circulated the month nine figures at the same time as the executive management team get them, uh, the financial monitoring pack comes out and gets circulated to everybody. Those discussions started with the, the Scottish government, and it was only a matter of a week, ten days, uh, sorry, about, like it was about a fortnight before the formal papers came out uh, formally reporting that position uh, to the board. Uh, and indeed in public. Um, so it, 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 to call it an emergency, a special meeting, I've got members that come from Mull, uh, uh, down in Mullock and Tyre, from Sky. Um, you know, to get them all together at a short notice is difficult, but also we did not, and, and you know, with hind even with hindsight, I don't think I would have called an emergency board meeting uh, for that, uh, looking at the overall position of the board and the scale of the brokerage that was being looked at as a proportion of our budget. Just, 
sorry, may, may I just come in there if I may? Um, because we did have some discussion, as we've said, at an improvement committee, and those, that improvement committee is a subcommittee of the board as well. The minutes do go to the board. Um, but it is one of the things that we've taken heed of in the um, Auditor General's report, and we're working now with our colleagues in audit to try and change the timing between the um, publishing of the uh, in-month annual the in month figures so that we can then be reporting to a board in a more timely way so we're trying to concertina that down that was one of the difficulties that we had around this crucial time was the timing of the improvement committee and the board meetings and the publication of the um, in month figures and, and hopefully now we'll have those tied much more tightly together and just one last quick question about uh, the internal audit summary of findings from the section 22 review on page 2 top paragraph, um, it says one of the key actions relates to accountability of budget holders. I mean, I'm astonished that they weren't being held accountable to their budgets already. But it says here that uh, the Rigmore Head of Finance has developed a budget holder register and implemented several new controls. Doesn't sound, doesn't sound very positive in what it's doing, what's happening. Several new controls, I hope there'll be a lot more controls. And a budget holder register, I would hope there would be a process already in place that held budget holders to account. Uh, can you maybe comment on, on, on how effective these new measures are going to be? This is this was one of the key issues, as I said, that we raised in the internal audit report, was that there was a lack of accountability with budget holders within the hospital. Um, if, if budget holders had been held fully to account for not overspending on their budgets, then the, the hospital wouldn't have gotten in the situation of overspending by millions of pounds. Is your 2013 report? Yes. With the, the, the results which, of course, were not implemented? The, so the, uh, they have been gradually been implemented since April 2013. So when we did the follow-up review in May 2014, we found that there had been progress in implementing the recommendations, albeit it was slow progress. Because, as, as I say, it, it, you know, there's a cultural change required there in terms of holding people to account. But, but, you're, oh. but you're right, these are, these, are, these, are, these are fairly fundamental management controls which should, should have been in place at the hospital and weren't in place. And what management are doing now, financial management, is much stronger in the hospital than it was when we did the review in April 2013, and they're putting those controls in place that should have already been there. As internal audit, to what extent did, did the non-implementation of the 2013 recommendations contribute to the problems, of course, that came out in 2013-14? If they had been fully implemented promptly, would that have ameliorated the impact, financial impact? Um, Yes, it would have ameliorated the financial impact, yes, because uh, the, 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 the hospital wouldn't have, uh, presumably wouldn't have overspent by as much as it did. But the hospital had been overspending for a while on an annual basis at around about the same level, and that position had been managed internally. So the, so the rest of the health board effectively was managing that position uh, because there was you know, managing the overspends within the hospital by making compensations elsewhere within within the, the health board, um, so you know the, the fact that they hadn't been addressed, the, those controls hadn't been improved, um, didn't mean that there was no way the health board could have ma could have managed the situation because they had been doing that on an annual basis up until then. But it definitely would have made it easier because uh, it, it, it's a real challenge. And, and and I think right at the end of the year, what happened was. There was a bit of additional activity commissioned internally within the hospital without a recognition of the financial implication of that decision. So, so the, and the financial implication came through the following month, by which time it was too late to make a, any amendments to the budget. This is right at the very end of the year. Um, so, and, and if the improvements that we recommended in April 2013 had all been implemented, uh, that kind of decision wouldn't, that kind of situation wouldn't have arisen. They might have still made the same management decision, which is basically to treat more patients, but it would have been they would have recognised the financial implication more clearly and reported that more clearly internally. Uh, so they could have made you know hopefully quicker uh, decisions about what you know what to do in terms of brokerage. Can I just conclude with a couple of questions? Uh, and firstly, to yourself, Mr. Coots, in connection with the 
discussion we had earlier about the signing off of the brokerage arrangement. You presented that to your board. What was the date that you said that you presented, or the month? That, that was formally announced to the board on the 1st of April. The okay. uh, papers were published for that a fortnight before then, so and board awareness of it was, was clear. So can I ask you, how many board members do you have? Uh, the total board's about 25, but there's so, about 10 independent uh, members. I don't have the so, figures. It's a large so board. In response to that paper being issued in the two weeks prior to the board, did you receive any informal or formal uh, responses from the board members saying, why have we signed off this brokerage deal? Uh, Surely we should have been informed. Um, I got uh, numerous discussions with uh, board members. Um, yeah, there's a difference between discussions. Uh, did did yeah. somebody call you and say, why were we not specifically said, but, no, why I, were we not informed? Every single one of my board members knew that if we were not going to be able to break even, it's then we would have seeken It's not the question, though, I think. Can, can so, I just be clear, though, the question is, did anybody phone you and say, you know, I mean, I, I would have expected one member of that board at least. Uh, I would have expected a board member to phone me up if they hadn't known that that was the inevitable consequence no. of what we would no. do. So absolutely no, I'm going to so, say no. Can we just be clear, not. but I think, to, and can, can we be fair, I've given you an opportunity to answer all the questions you have. I think you've been very open on right. some of them, and some of them need to require further clarity. And I think well, the question here is, when the board members were advised the prior notice, of the two weeks prior to the committee, committee the board meeting was take place, did members of the board call you and say, I'm concerned that we were not informed, yes or no? No. So none of them called you to say they were concerned? Not, not, not to my recollection. The For the reasons so, that I've explained, not to my recollection. Not one member? For the reasons that I've explained, not to my recollection. Okay. And Ms. Mead, was there any members of the board called you or the, Mr. Kenton, anybody call you to say, you know, we're concerned that we weren't informed that we're signing off this brokerage arrangement? No, convener, they did not ask me that. Okay. So there's no correspondence exchange, emails exchange, anything like that that would pre present anyone saying, nobody emailed you to say why we're, why we're doing this, what are the consequences of this? I, no. I have no recollection of any emails or correspondence around okay. the reason for why that. we were doing that. Just finally, Ms. Mead. So. One of the issues in our internal audit review was to ask board members if they felt they were kept informed, and they all said you know, very clearly that they were. So none of them said that they, it was a surprise to them. Okay. Finally, in terms of the, obviously, discussions that took place and there was an agreement to sign off this brokerage arrangement with the Scottish Government. Ms. Mee, can you advise me what would happen if, or what would have happened in the position if the Scottish Government said that they would refuse that arrangement? Would there be potential job losses or loss of service? We, we have a statutory responsibility to break even, so we would have had to look at how can we then um, look at services in order to reduce activity between that point in time and the end of the financial year. Now, that wouldn't have resulted necessarily in job losses, if, but we would have... It could have, though. We, we would have had to look at how we could have reconfigured our services in the short term in order to... Yeah, but re reconfigure means possibly job losses, well, is that correct? Well, some of the, the expenditure would have been on additional payments, so yeah. that would have reduced our cost on so, supplementary staffing. So, for example, if we wouldn't have increased um, a ward area, if we would not have kept a ward area, that may not have resulted in job losses, that may have resulted in some people not doing extra hours and therefore doing ex being paid for extra duties, which would so, have been different. So can I simulate this? Can I play this out then? Of course. You've had to consider the possibility that the Scottish Government would say, no, we're not going to sign a brokerage agreement. Were there papers developed or discussed to see the possibility of job losses as a result of this arrangement not being signed off? So are there documents that exist to say, let's look at the possibility that the Scottish Government says, we can't give you a brokerage arrangement? Because they could have said that. They, they could have said that, Mr Martin, but we, we have a no-redundancy policy in the NHS, so we wouldn't have been in a position to take jobs out and make people redundant, if okay. that's the question. But there would have been a reduction in services across the board? There would have inevitably have had to have been a and, reduction in and services. And that paper, there was a paper presented to, to present the kind of loss of service that could exist? Not a paper in that way, no, we were looking... Why not? Because at the point, that point of time, we were uh, looking to deliver break-even through the management 
uh, actions that we'd asked people to take. And we were confident that we would have delivered those until such time as we saw the deterioration in the Ragmore position. That made us have to go back and reconsider our financial endpoint. Okay, but you, but you had to. I mean, just in conclusion, though, I think we need to accept the scenario could have been that the Scottish government could have says, "Very sorry, but we don't have this money to provide to you." You would surely have had some kind of position, some plan B. Was there no plan B? There always has to be a plan B. So, 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 plan what, B so was there then? That would have had to have been to reduce services in the short term. Okay, so you have a, you had a paper prepared for that scenario. We would have had some background papers where we were considering what would have been the impact okay. on our other statutory requirements to deliver targets. As so, well. as a result of poor financial management, there could have been a loss of services, and that's the kind of discussion that you had to have. Only in that last month of, of the year. Yeah. So the scenario could have been that people, the kind of services that we all take for granted, could have been at risk. In that last month of the year, where we have a statutory requirement to financially break even, that could have been a risk. So give me just before we conclude one example then of the kind of service that could have been lost during that period. In that period, we may have not been able to continue to do additional waiting list initiatives, which would have allowed us to see more patients needing their operations, and those patients may well have had to wait. And there could have, could have been appointments cancelled or anything like that? Or? The associated it's appointments with those operations may well have needed to have been okay. not appointed in the first place. Okay. Can I thank the panel for the time this morning? I appreciate it's been a long session. Uh, and thank you very much. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're now going to move into private session as agreed earlier.